are back on the Zero Hour. I'm Richard R.J. Eskow with more of our post-election, well, I would say wrap-up doesn't really do it justice, but here to help us understand what happened is one of the Democratic Party's and the progressive movement's leading strategists, Celinda Lake, is president of Lake Research Partners and a go-to person for understanding this sort of thing. Celinda, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Well, listen, here's my first question for you as we try to sort out uh, the aftermath of the hurricane that seems to have just blown through town. Um, Even grading on a curve, look, everybody knew this was a tough year for Democrats. A lot of seats needed to be defended in the Senate. There was a good chance they'd lose the Senate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But even grading on a curve, accounting for all of that, this was worse than expected, right? Yes, this was way worse than expected. So uh, now do we have a sense yet, obviously it's less than uh, 24 hours after the polls closed, do we have a sense of why this turned out and why our estimates were off? Well, um, there were a number of things going on. First of all, it was a wave election and waves break late. So in terms of our estimates being off, some of this is very, very rapidly changing defection among independents over the course of the last five days of the campaign. And most campaigns stop polling five days out because there's just not a whole lot you can change. Secondly, we know that um, we had massive turnout problems and we knew that we were going to have them. We did everything we could to fix them. But um, in the end, um, we didn't fix them. And uh, frankly, um, part of why I think we didn't fix them is we didn't have enough. uh, It's not just a question of technique. Uh, You have to have a message, in particular an economic message, and we didn't have one. Uh, So I think that was a huge factor. Um, The electorate was older, whiter, and more male than the 2012 election, and uh, turnout was down even from 2010. So that really hurt us. Um, And, for example, um, one of the more noticeable groups was women voters. Uh, who made up only 51% of the electorate. And then uh, we won women by a lot less than we lo- lost men by. And that's a formula for failure. So if we try to break those the, those figures apart, first of all, when we say it's a wave election, I think a lot of people don't really understand entirely what that means. In other words, uh, there's a dynamic at work. Mm-hmm. But what what is that? Time? What do we mean when we say it's a wave election? Well, one of the things we mean, we mean that things break kind of irrespective of what you're doing as a campaign. So there were two aspects, I think, in which this was a wave election. One aspect was that we had in late deciding independent voters break all one way. And they usually do, frankly, um, one way or the other. In 2008, they broke all our way. 2006, they broke all our way. 2014, they broke all the Republican way. And then the second thing, in this case, I think the wave also affected turnout. I think a lot of people who had been pretty disengaged to begin with just felt, um, you know, no one's speaking to me. No one's really proposing policies that affect my life. Um, the country's in terrible shape, and uh, I'm going to stay home. Well, you know, when we think about a wave, we think about, and, and, and this is why I'm, I want to make sure people understand what we're talking about, because I, I, I think there will be a tendency to say, uh, among some, to say, well, this was kind of like a force of nature, like a tsunami, and we got in the way, and everybody got washed away. But while, while it seems to me that there were there might have been different scenarios for this election, and and I wanted to ask you about that. For example, uh, I spent I, I did some coverage, uh, broadcast coverage of the election last night. Saw a lot of Mark Pryor's ads, for example, in um, Arkansas, really trying hard. And some of the other candidates did the same thing, trying hard. The Democratic candidates not to appear to stand for anything specific. Um, I don't want to, you know, be unfair, but I, the, the impression they leave, for example, one prior ad said, you know, both neither party has a monopoly on the truth. He begins, and so you know, my loads, my north star is the Bible. Well, that's fine, and 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 uh, no disrespect intended to the Bible, but if every candidate you know waves the Bible, you don't know what anybody stands for. So. Um, 
you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is we had an election where it seemed to me a lot of Democrats, uh, Pryor and Nunn and uh, Hagan and so on, spent a lot of time distancing themselves, not only from the, an unpopular president, but from their party and the things it's associated with in the public mind. Is that, am I right about that? And to what extent could that have been a real mistake on their part? Well, I think that, um, <laughs> I think it, it, I don't know that there's one size fits all answer to that, honestly. I think, um, if you have a candidate that won't even tell you who they voted for when they've been a, a delegate to the convention, that's kind of foolish. And, um, particularly, I think if you asked voters, 95% of voters would have said, I assume she voted for Barack Obama. So then you're just striking at the core of your character, your authenticity. And it's such right. an easy question to answer, which is, um, yes, I voted for the president because I thought he was uh, better, and I'm disappointed in what he's done. And when it's good for Kentucky, I'll support him. When it's bad for Kentucky, I'll stand up to him. I mean, it's such an easy question to answer. Um, you're not buying anything by such a bizarre answer that just sounds like you're lying to voters. Um right. In other cases where people said, you know, I'm, you know, Barack Obama's on the, on the ballot, you know, this isn't about Barack Obama. He's there for two years. We're there for, I'm going to be there for six. Um, that's, you know, I think just the truth. So the Republicans were very, very successful in making this a wave election around Barack Obama. Um, but I, and I think individual candidates struggle with that in a variety of different ways, some more effective than others. But frankly, the wave was so great, nothing became that effective. But I don't think there's one size fits all, particularly when you're talking about candidates running in such red states where Barack Obama lost. Right, right. And, 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 and I, again, I guess I would say some of these outcomes may not be surprising. The margins may, may be surprising, though. Um, and, and well, the gubernatorial just, ones are the ones that I think are surprising. And um, I think the other thing is, and, and I think they're the real wake-up call, if things were just anti-Obamacare, the governors have nothing to do with Obamacare. If things were just anti-incumbency, these governors were incumbents. I think the challenge is much greater to the Democrats. And the challenge is people want to, want to know that we can get things done. And I don't think it's accidental that two of the people that won close Senate races were actually ex-governors, uh, Warner and Shaheen, uh, because they have some credentials on getting things done. Uh, and then the second thing I think is we need an economic message. And until we get one, we've never won an election where the Democrats have not been ahead on the economy and on jobs. We didn't win 2012 until we started to get ahead on jobs. On election day, we were dead even on the economy and jobs and economic voters split and we lost the voters who thought things were not in good shape. That's a formula for disaster for our party. So uh, we have a, um, I, I guess then the question is when we talk about authenticity, uh, whether it's at the gubernatorial, I mean, I, it, what I get out of that is the combination of uh, authenticity and being authoritative. The idea that a governor, for example, projects a kind of executive confidence and yeah. a uh, a, and a, an authentic candidate is one, I mean, one of the things that struck me about the prior about the prior ads was the lack of uh, seeming authenticity in them, too. It was, it was almost, I felt like you're watching a guy trying to hide who he really is. That was my real frustration with those well, ads. Well, and I think one of the things that was interesting about Pryor is that um, he really had some of the most authentic ads in the cycle. Like the ad when he and his father around cancer, that was just so, and that was on one of the toughest issues out there, Obamacare. But that was just so authentic. So it's ironic because I think he is a very honest, decent person. And I think that he ran some of the most authentic ads in the cycle. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't happen to see them, but we're talking with Cinda Lake, Celinda Lake, uh, president of Lake Research Partners, about the election results. And I guess I wanted to talk uh, 
I, I want to move into a different category, and I think my pivot issue is Obamacare or the Health Care Act. Uh, here's how uh, you're much more expert at reaching reading polls than I am, but here's how I read the polls. Okay, you have 48% disapproval, give or take, depending on which poll you read. You have 47%, give or take, uh, sometimes those numbers are reversed, of people who either approve of the law or think it doesn't go far enough. So... I kind of read that as with the right campaign, it would not have been a decisive issue. In fact, it could have been a good leveraging issue to turn out the Democratic base. You've got that chunk of people who like it or think it doesn't go far enough say, we want to build on it, we want to do more with it, we want to stop the obstruction that's prevented it from being rolled out in the following 20 states or whatever the figure is now. Um, it seems to me that that's a perfect example where they might have stood their ground and fought to advance. And instead, what they chose to do was either change, try to change the subject or evade the issue or somehow poses Republican light, for lack of a better term. Is that, could there have been a different approach to, let's well, say, Obamacare? Well, Obamacare was not what they ran at the end of the campaigns. Actually, what they ran was Obama. So most of these Senate races, they did not end on Obamacare. They ended on 97% vote with the president, 98%, 99%, whatever the heck it was. Um, so it's interesting that they didn't run on Obamacare. They ran Obama. The second thing that I would say about Obamacare is I think you're right about the campaign. You're absolutely right about that. But I don't think it's a campaign that any individual candidate for Senate could run. That is the campaign. What you outlaw is the campaign that should have been run up from about Obamacare from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what is highly ironic here is that even the people who have gotten insurance under Obamacare say that they are against Obamacare. And even poor people are against Obamacare. And people who agree with every single one of the provisions and say this is exactly what we should do, say they're against Obamacare. So this, we have allowed this program to be so distorted and, and I that think, it's frankly astounding. <clears throat> and I think I would add to that, Selinda, that, uh, you know, I worked in the health insurance industry for years. I know that, I mean, I think uh, perhaps the mistake we made was not explaining that Obamacare will give more people health insurance, but we still have to make sure we manage the health insurance industry. So every time someone has a frustration, I, I can see how somebody might get health insurance under Obamacare, then be frustrated with their premiums or the lack of coverage. There has to be a way to say, no, this is part of a progression toward a better health care system and not be not walk away from that, not hide it, not, uh, not uh, exaggerate uh, what's been done so far, but build on it. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but... Uh, I think it speaks to a strategy of saying we created this law because we're fighting for you and we'll make it better because we're fighting for you. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, gosh, Obamacare is just such a, first of all, I would say my, my major thought is Obamacare is its own whole show. And I think it's <laughs> a, it's such a complex prism to view the election through, to be honest with you. That said, much of what you're saying about Obamacare is exactly right. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's several things going on. Number one, I think that um, what the experience with ACA has proven is that there's no dealing with the insurance industry. Right. And those of us who support a public option, those of us who supported single payer originally, and I put, I am in that category, we worked hard for single payer, and then we compromised. You know what? We were wrong. We shouldn't have done that because... Right we were right about the fact that private insurance companies cannot be trusted with this. And, um, you know, our own small company, when we went to get our premium, uh, our plan re we had a 60% increase in our premiums. And they blamed it on Obamacare. It's right. insane. So you're absolutely right. The insurance company is acting totally irresponsibly here. And then they will blame everything on Obamacare. There's no recourse in half the states. The, many of the states didn't do what they were supposed to do, which was to expand Medicaid, which is wildly popular with voters. Many of the states don't have the insurance commissioners or whatever who can hold the companies accountable. Uh, you know, in some states, you can take a rate increase like that for appeal. In other states where the mechanism doesn't exist, you can't. And so it's, you're absolutely right. There are some real problems here that need to get be fixed. 
Boy, you know, you're absolutely right, Celinda, that number one, that would be an entirely other show. Boy, do we have a lot to talk about. Boy, are we on the same page. Before we're going to go to a break, there are some more things I want to ask you about the election. We'll go to a quick break. But sure. before we do, I just want to say I'm exactly where you are on the Affordable Health Care Act. And I went in there saying I'm willing to compromise because I don't think that single payer is politically feasible. I'm yeah. now convinced it's the only solution that I ultimately is. Feasible. And it was such a mistake. I made such a mistake in this. Absolutely. But when we come back, we'll be talking more about the election results with Celinda Lake, president of Lake Research Partners. We will be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour. And we are back on the Zero Hour. I'm Richard R.J. Escal. We are talking with Celinda Lake, a leading Democratic and progressive strategist, president of Lake Research Partners, about the election. As the poet said, of all the words of tongue and pen, the saddest are it might have been. But <laughs> having said that, is there any way to know? How this race might have looked different if, for lack of a better shorthand, if more Democrats had run like Elizabeth Warren, if they had said the ga- the rules are rigged, the game is rigged, uh, you know, the banks get uh, all the breaks, you don't, you know, we need an economy that works for you, et cetera, et cetera. We know the Warren um, the Warren speech, and it's a terrific one. Do we know, A, how an approach like that might have affected turnout, and B, uh, what it might have done to those late-breaking voters, those wave voters. You know, we don't. And um, it's it's appealing um, because I totally believe in that. It is, and we test it time and time again. It tests off the charts. It's a very strong platform for 2016. But I don't know that any of these candidates really got heard, no matter what their message was. Mm. I mean, once the voters turned and said, I want to send a message. I am mad as hell, and I am going to show it. I don't know that there is much um, that any message would have done. And then the fact is the table was set so strongly against us because of the kinds of states where we had Senate seats up. So I think that's a strongly winning message. Whether it could have survived this wave, I don't know. Well, yeah, and and, and bear in mind, my principle is still beating on a I mean, this was weighted against the Democrats very heavily. We know that, that this time around, it's going to be very different in 2016. I think, what, uh, 10, de- uh, 10 Democratic seats and 24 Republican mm-hmm. seats are. So, so it's very different in 2016. We get that. But having said that, even grading on a curve, things are bad. And so mm-hmm. I'm really, you know, just kind of experimenting with alternate scenarios here because we know the, we know this didn't work out well. Uh, for the Democrats, do we know? If, uh, uh, let's, for lack of a better term, the branding. I mean, what do uh, the Republicans? What do people think of when they think of the Republican brand? And what do they think of when they think of the Democratic brand? And do they think of anything except Barack Obama and that they're frustrated with him? Well. That is a super good question because people today are negative about the Democratic brand and they're negative about the Republican brand. They're more negative about the Republican brand than they are about the Democratic brand. Um, But they're most negative about the president. And um, the the thing I would say, well, actually, they're most negative about the job that Congress did. Um, A lot of governors survived because they made the argument that they delivered for their state. Mm-hmm. A lot of, um, in a lot of the Senate races, people just voted for change. They did kind of a Hail Mary and let's see what happens because it can't get any worse. So the dynamics were a little bit different, I think, in the two tiers of races. Although, um, you know, the same things were catalytic to those dynamics. Um, the thing that I think that we haven't discussed that's really important here is that the, there was, was not a rejection of the Democratic agenda. Because in point of fact, when voters had the ability to directly vote on things, whether it was cracked down on predatory lenders or safe pensions or pass minimum wage or turn back anti-choice measures or um, legalize marijuana and reform our criminal justice system, they did it. The progressive agenda succeeded. When voters could take matters into their own hands, they did it. Um, Right. And and I was going to ask you. That's the real challenge. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. First of all, I think you're, <clears throat> I'm sure you're right when you say that uh, 
voters were sending a message with their Senate votes that, uh, you know, let's try change. It can't get any worse. I wish someone had told them, oh, yes, it can. Well, I um, know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But but nobody did apparently, and and that gets uh, uh, that gets to a piece I'll put aside for a second, which is really explaining the obstructionist Republicans and whether that was ever done. But but I think you touched on something I definitely wanted to raise with you, which is they rejected Democrats, but in state after state, including these solidly GOP states, they voted to increase the minimum wage, and as you say, predatory right. lenders and 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 a choice and issue after issue of medical marijuana, except in Florida. Right. And we didn't win these Adelson. things just in yeah. liberal coastal states. I mean, we won minimum wage in places like South Dakota and Arkansas. We won um, the uh, some of these other measures, pensions in Arizona. I mean, we didn't win these in bastions of liberal thinking. Right. Uh, we won these in tough conservative states. We beat back anti-choice measures in North Dakota. I right. mean, these are not, it wasn't because, oh, yeah, well, California and New York pass these things. Quite the contrary. Yeah, and the, that, that gets to the essential paradox, it seems to me, of today's electorate. We're talking with Celinda Lake of Lake Research Partners, which is we have conservative voters who vote for progressive measures when they get the chance. We have uh, voters who, when they get the chance, embrace the Democratic agenda, but when it comes to uh, politicians, vote Republican. So seem, that's why I bring up the issue of branding. It seems to me the wires are crossed somewhere in this electorate, and there's got to be a way to untangle them. Um, I guess the, the question that I would also ask you is, the last time you and I talked, we talked about Social Security, which you said was a valence issue, was a critical issue, it was a values issue, it was a deciding factor. Did, uh, you know, a couple candidates, uh, most notably Mark Begich in mm -hmm. Alaska, made Social Security an issue. Yeah. Uh, Bra Braley in Iowa was had a kind of, I would characterize it as a deathbed conversion to the issue. In the right, last, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, if you read earlier we, on it, they might have been in better shape. Yeah. So I, I guess my question is, was that even a factor or, or was it never even given a chance to become a factor? You know, the campaigns ran it, ran these issues and ran on these things. Uh, it, it's hard to say, honestly, how much factor it was. Um, and um, I think that um, it's just... Uh, you know, when there's a wave, it's hard to understand what, if anything, came out from underneath the wave. Okay, so... Um, it so seems, honestly, like, I mean, there were two strategies, trying to establish their own independent record and try to destroy your opponent and make them illegitimate. And those are both tried and true strategies that normally work. But when you have a really strong... When voters really want to send a strong message, then... Um, they may just choose to do it, uh, no matter what. Yeah. So the the impression I get of this wave process, uh, you know, as you speak about it, I, I'm getting the mental image of you know uh, a chain reaction going out of control. You know, we almost yeah, lost Detroit. That's a great way kind to think of, about it. it. Yeah. That that once it starts generating and building up momentum, it reaches a point of no return, and maybe that in order to have avoided this wave. We would have had to roll back the clock to a year ago or 18 months ago and branded the Democratic Party as really different. And I guess the, the, the piece that I would also add to this, of course, that we've been talking, alluding to, but not directly addressing is uh, the role of the president himself in all this and the extent to which, if perhaps he had at least begun his second administration by saying, I have this agenda of A, B, C, and D, and this will help you, and I'm going to fight for you and make sure we create jobs and <clears throat> have an equitable tax system and give you stronger wages and a stronger minimum. I mean, he said those things at times, but uh, if he had said, I'm fighting, these guys are stopping me every step mm -hmm. of the way. All could right. we somehow have nipped this wave in the bud? Well, I think we could have definitely nipped this wave in the bud. And I think that one of the ways we could have lift this, lift, nipped this wave in the bud is I believe, and I have argued it, vocally for a year, I think the president, you know, in early this year, April, May of this year, for his own job approval numbers, should have said, you know, we've made this progress. It's not good enough. Here's what we're going to do. And we're going to fight every day to get this economy going. And we're not going to stop until this economy offers opportunity for everyone's kid, no matter what zip code you live in, 
and offers prosperity for every family, no matter where you are. It, you know, here's what we're going to do. And, and, it, and it can't just be minimum, as much as these pol- policies are popular, it can't just be raising the minimum wage and equal pay. Because, you know, in the end, that's not, those are good things, but that's not a major economic presidential platform. Right, right. Uh, and, and you know, I've always said that uh, we're we're talking. I mean, with you said Lake, it. Where's the, the jobs Research program? When are you right. announcing? Uh, I mean, <laughs> right, exactly. And 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 uh, I've always you know, people talk about low information voters, but I've always said you know every voter has high information about their own life. That's and right. That's are, exactly right. And, and they know, and they pay attention to things that affect their lives. Right, and so they know that things are tough right now. They don't want to be told, well, the GDP right. isn't right. as bad as we thought it was. Right. And, uh, you know, the S and P 500 is, well, they, they forget it, you know? Right. So I, I, so, okay. So y- you and I both remember a time when Democrats were marginalized for being too liberal right. because they were for pot, uh, <laughs> abortion and gay marriage. Now we have an, we have an electorate that seems to have come out in support of pot, choice, right. a, we a gay right. marriage, and Republicans. <laughs> I know. I know. That's what's crazy, the, right? Right. Of all but the things know, that have made of, me bang I mean, my head on One of the things we haven't desk. discussed is these Republican candidates were a lot more careful about these issues. So, for example... <laughs> Uh, Cory Gardner changes his position on personhood. Now, that's pretty darn audacious. Um, uh, Dan Sullivan changes his position between the primary and the general on choice and changes his position on the minimum wage ballot initiative. I mean, these candidates, I mean, two years ago, we were ending with candidates who were saying, I am not a witch and um, uh, defining legitimate rape. This year, we had candidates ending, moving in the position of their voters on these initiatives. Yes, that's very interesting. And we had, as you and I talked about last time, I believe we had Republican candidates uh, going, moving to the left of the Simpson Bowles plan and attacking Democrats for voting for it. That's so right. I, I, I guess the question, well, there's so many. First of all, Celinda, Celinda, like you are an expert in this stuff. So far, what haven't I asked you about that I should have asked you about? <laughs> I think you've done a great job. Uh, and uh, it's been a, it's been really a fun conversation. I think we're fighting campaign finance. We mu- I don't mm-hmm. care what your issue is. We must fight for campaign finance reform. It is completely corrupting of the system. And the most honest, the most progressive candidate, um, it is corrupting. The second thing I think is that. Um, you know, we must dominate candidates who do not take their positions from their consultants. I mean, we were once asked by a candidate to poll on whether or not to go into Iraq in the war. And as a firm, we were completely against going into Iraq. We had candidates that were for it. We had candidates that were against it. We turned that candidate down because we said it is immoral to poll on your position on a war, for God's sakes. Mm-hmm. I would rather disagree with you and have you before the war than to pull and take on something of that level of impact from a poll. You should not do that. Um, and there are lots of candidates. I mean, Elizabeth Warren uh, does not take her positions from polling data. Right. She may be influenced by it in the sense of how do I effectively articulate my argument, and that's a great use of polling. Right. But not, you should not take, and, and so I think, I think we need to nominate candidates who know who they are. Now, ironically, and this is the really sad thing, I think we have a really good field of candidates in uh, 2014 uh, for the most part. And there's, there are a couple of exceptions whom I won't name, but for the most part, I think we had really good candidates. What we didn't have, I mean, good candidates, good campaigns, I don't care what it was, this was just a wave election that ended up being almost impossible to break through. Right. And um, I think when you've we're got going Mark to Warner getting into trouble. I mean, good Lord. Well, you know, and by the way, I, I, I guess the only other issue I would bring up is, <clears throat> excuse me, the extent to which 
uh, there was a strategy, consciously or not, of centrist and or what some people uh, disparagingly refer to as Republican light, I would suggest that that certainly didn't stop the wave. I mean, you had Charlie Crist, an actual uh, former Republican, good guy, mm-hmm, you know, I mean, mm-hmm, I, I'm not mm-hmm. down on Charlie Chris, but, you no. know, Republican turned Democrat clearly in the Beltway version of the center, which is not the electorate's version mm-hmm. of the center, but, but, but he was there and he ran against arguably, I mean, you could, the right, uh, the right candidate could point out all sorts of things about Rick Scott that look pretty sinister and the Medicare and the, you know, all of the things. And Rick Scott himself is not an appealing, doesn't right. come across to I, I know, appealing. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So, but, so I guess the question is, is this an election in which we can finally, in addition to saying Democrats need authenticity, Democrats should, would do better running on fighting for uh, the middle class and lower income people, all of those things, a more Elizabeth Warren strategy. Is it also possible to conclude that the centrist uh, Republican light strategy is not the magic wand some people seem to have thought it was? Yeah, for sure. But I think we didn't even need this election to know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, it's a shame because I think that, you know, a lot of times, certainly when you're in my line of work, people think you, you know, you have personal aversion to the uh, people in office when they do things you don't like far from it i mean i know I've met many of them they're very nice people i'm sorry to see uh people out of out of work and i'm sorry to see so much disappointment around the country i'm certainly sorry to see what's going to happen to this country in the next two years yeah with, amen with to these that. guys um but uh I guess final question in terms of changing the culture of the democratic party any words of advice or the political system at all? Get money out of politics. You're absolutely right. I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, we're going to uh, we're going to be pushing on that. Uh, any last words of wisdom? I would say two things. Number one, we have to realize that for all the great tactics we have, if you don't have a message, you're not going to get your base out. And number two, we have to get an economic platform. Right, a- absolutely. Or we will lose the 2016 elections, too. And I guess I would only add to that, the reinforce your point about authenticity. In a race between a candidate and a non-candidate, the candidate wins every time. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> exactly right. All right, well, great to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. So Linda Lake, president of Lake Research Par- Partners, leading Democratic and progressive consultant. Thanks so much for speaking with us. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour. 